Our next speaker is uh, Scott Morrison. Uh, Scott's a senior project manager and strategic consultant for Jacobs Engineering Group. Scott has broad experience in water resource planning and evaluations in all areas of drinking water system operation and management. Scott's currently leading the agricultural water resiliency planning for the Central Utah Water Conser uh, Conservancy District and the Colorado River Authority of Utah. He's additionally engaged in a number of planning efforts related to the Great Salt Lake. Scott resides in Park City, Utah, where he enjoys spending time in the mountains with his wife and two daughters. So uh, thank you, Scott. Yep, thank you. Well, hi and sorry about that. Hi and good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good. Awesome. Yeah, good to hear. Um, it's been a great um, last 24 hours. I think this has been awesome. Um, continuously um, speaking for myself, just continuously learning uh, from all of you, um, um, Sarah included, following her. Um, definitely interested to talk more to her about um, some of the UCR programs that um, they're running. Um, but I, th I hope through my discussion, um, as you have questions or if there's an opportunity to provide additional um, input or um, you know context to some of the points that I'm sharing. Um, please ask questions. Anxious to again continue that learning process and continue the collaboration that we've uh, benefited from here as a group. I think um, as we look forward, there's really difficult uh, water challenges ahead, and I think this conference has been an example of the type of collaboration that. Um, is um, not only needed, but is refreshing, um, you know, to as we try to overcome some of these challenges ahead. So uh, with that, um, I will jump into uh, my slides. All right, so investigating agricultural resilience opportunities in Utah, um, an open ET uh, supported approach is the title of my discussion today. Um, I want to start just with an acknowledgement uh, for Central Utah Water Conservancy District as well as the Colorado River Authority of Utah who um, have supported and helped to make this work possible. Um, it's their combined interest in drought mitigation planning in the Colorado River Basin that um, again has supported this work. Um, just a quick look ahead at the next 10-15 uh, minutes or so. Um, I'm going to step through just a quick overview of the agricultural resiliency plan that um, both Central Utah and the River Authority um, are engaged in. Uh, we'll talk about methods that we used for quantifying field scale depletion uh, using OpenET data, um, specifically the EE metric model. Um, we'll move then into a discussion of the depletion results um, that we arrived at and the characterization of those results uh, by irrigation methods as well as crop types. And then lastly, I'll, I'll provide just a little uh, brief look ahead um, of next steps. Um, how are we going to use this data and how does this data support um, additional investigations into agricultural resiliency opportunities? So a uh, quick overview. Um, again, I mentioned before um, these two agencies, uh, both Central Utah as well as the uh, River Authority, both have common interests in drought mitigation um, and specifically in the Colorado River Basin. Um, this work really was supported or, or uh, foundationally supported by their incredible working relationship um, between both um, and has provided a really constructive working um, you know, relationship for me and also for this work to progress. Um, the Agricultural Resiliency Plan um, has a primary objective of identifying opportunities to reduce um, consumptive use in agriculture such that um, water supply shortage, shortage risks uh, can be mitigated both for producers as well as uh, the authority in central Utah alike. Um, we, the, the agricultural resiliency plan included three primary components or really four primary components. One is um, looking at what is the available water supply. The second is to evaluate uh, what are the agricultural water demands. Third is to identify, again, these opportunities for reducing those demands or reducing the depletion aligned with agricultural use. Um, and then fourth, there's an uh, economic uh, impact um, review that's being done as well to evaluate what are the economic um, impacts to some of these programs, uh, both at the community level, but also 
to evaluate potential incentives that may be appropriate for um, um, programs that may exist in, in the future. I'll, I'll note, along with you know, those four objectives, the, the original intent was um, for us to perform a high-level review, and I think for any of you that have dug into effective precipitation or um, my early realization that consumptive use and depletion and consumptive use of irrigation water and ET of applied water all meant the same thing, yet different at different times, um, it was clear that a high-level review was going to be quite tricky. Um, moving on now to our, to our study area. So um, first, the study area includes uh, the Central Utah Water Conservancy District Service Area. Um, that's identified in the dashed white border you can see in the um, northeastern corner of the state of Utah. Um, secondly, the Colorado River Basin lands within Utah which are identified um, through the, the gray or uh, light blue coloring you can see um, eastern and southern side of the state there with um, the cross hatching identifies uh, or delineates the upper Colorado River Basin from um, uh, lower basin um, lands that reside there in the southern portion of the state. Um, this crosses uh, roughly or includes roughly seven hydrologic basins, uh, Weber River Basin, it um, sort of grazes the surface there of uh, central Utah service area, uh, but very few fields um, within Weber River Basin are included. Um, lastly, I'll just note that you'll hear me talk about um, interest areas uh, through this discussion. We had four primary interest areas. Uh, one would be the district service lands that, uh, that fall outside of the Colorado River Basin. Um, the second would be district um, service area lands that are included in the upper Colorado River Basin. Third would be Upper Colorado River Basin lands that are outside of the district, and lastly would be the Lower Colorado River Basin lands. So as we look to try to quantify um, field scale depletion using OpenET, um, it was really supported by the intersection of three um, data sets or, or um, data sources. Um, one is the state's water-related land use data set that is uh, administered and uh, maintained by the Division of Water Resources, um, Utah's Division of Water Resources. Um, second is open ET data. I uh, mentioned previously we use the EE metric uh, model data, and that was really um, you know, following in the footsteps of uh, the UCRC resolution that um, Sarah talked about earlier with um, using EE metric um, for um, quantifying consumptive use in the upper basin. And then thirdly, um, precipitation data sets. So DAMAT's listed here. Um, I'm also going to touch on um, effective precipitation raster data sets that um, DRI supported us with um, as part of our analysis. And it's really the intersection of these three data sets um, that enables this calculation of field scale depletion using adopted methods. So what are these adopted methods? So we looked at two um, different methods. So what I'll call method one, we used to estimate um, the depletion on upper, predominantly upper Colorado River Basin lands. Um, this was supported again by the effective precipitation raster data sets uh, provided by DRI uh, with approval from reclamation. Um, and our calculation uh, of depletion in that case um, follows um, the phase three um, consumptive use report um, that UCRC released um, in late 2022, um, Appendix G talks about it, um, but essentially that depletion is equal to the uh, EE metric ET data um, subtracting off effective precipitation from the raster um, data sets from DRI. Um, the second method that we looked at was uh, we needed to, to have a method to quantify a depletion on lands outside of the Upper Colorado River Basin because the DRI data sets um, did not um, cover um, this area of our, of our study. So um, we used um, a method that's more specifically described in Dr. Hill's report from 1989 um, aligned with the Bear River Compact. So depletion in this case um, equals similarly to um, E metric ET data um, subtracting off Effective precipitation, which based on the Hill report is um, they, um, uh, they use an 80% factor. So 80% of the observed precipitation is deemed to be effective. 
Um, and then lastly, there's a calculation for carryover soil moisture um, described in the report to account for that as well. These, these results then, um, through these two methods, were then aggregated um, from the basin scale up to um, the various interest areas, um, up to um, the study area, and using GIS, really easy to, to cut and carve that data up and look at it um, based on the various boundaries that we wanted to look at. Um, I think important to note that wherever we had an effective precipitation raster data value um, from DRI that could be utilized, um, method one was used for that field quantification, and then method two, again, was used for those fields um, where that um, effective precipitation rasted, raster data was not available. So jumping into some results here. So across our study area, again, including both um, district service area lands as well as Colorado River Basin lands within the state of Utah, uh, we see agricultural depletions that range from roughly 900,000 acre feet up to about 1.16 uh, million acre feet with about a little short of 600,000 acre feet um, identified in the upper basin. That's an average across the 2017 through 2020 water years. Um, I think important to note that those water years 2017 through 2020 were the subject of our investigation, um, again, tied to those effective precipitation raster data sets. Um, those were only available for the 2017 through 2020 water years. Um, looking at the consumptive uses and losses report, as was discussed this morning, um, the average irrigation depletions in Utah were about 750,000 acre feet, um, you know, substantially higher um, than the results that, that we obtained. Um, you know, just a couple, uh, a couple notes, I guess. From, um, from my reading of the report, it appears as though the consumptive use and losses are based on calendar year. Um, our results are based on water year, so we've got some discrepancies there. Um, and then as far as um, being biased high or low, um, I think the, um, just a couple thoughts on open ET data. Um, we've heard about uh, field, um, we've heard about advective uh, or uh, the effects of advection at our uh, field boundaries um, that could be driving um, the open ET values lower. Um, in the desert southwest, particularly in areas where you have um, non-irrigated fields adjacent to, or non-irrigated areas adjacent to irrigated fields. Um, and then another um, thought that I had is just um, wind drift is also something that, so, you know, there's some losses tied to wind drift that wouldn't be picked up uh, through the open ET data. Um, excuse me one second. And then as far as the, I'm um, thinking about um, just discrepancies here as far as the consumptive use and losses report. Um, in the report, it also talks about, uh, oh, what is the, uh, um, oh, the word's escaping me. Some, ad some additional demands that are included um, in the consumptive uses and losses uh, for Utah. Um, oh, it'll come to me, but. It, thank you. That's the word I was looking for. So incidental uses, incidental demands. Um, interested to hear more about um, what some of those demands may be, but um, you know that's something that is likely not included in our analysis. And then secondly, although shortage is evaluated in the consumptive use and uses and losses, um, you know my understanding is if the water is available, it'll fulfill the full water demands of a given field, essentially a potential ET or a potential demand of the field where uh, the open ET data is going to provide, you know, more of an observed or more of an actual um, ET measurement that would pick up on um, crop stress um, due to deficit irrigation or other factors that may be going on. Just another note here, we did look at, um, again, I mentioned the two methods that, um, that we evaluated, method one and method two. Um, we looked at what is the difference um, between those methods. So on those upper Colorado River Basin lands where we had um, data to support calculation uh, via both of those methods, um, 
we ran both of those, we compared and contrasted those, we found that for a given field, um, we found an average difference of about seven to nine percent. Um, I think notably, that comparison is really looking at the differences in effective precipitation calculations since the E metric ET data is consistent across both of those methods, but um, it just shows that um, you know, we attempted to take a look at uh, what those differences may be. So next is the comparison with uh, Utah's water budget model. Uh, Rachel touched on this this morning. So um, Utah has been, um, has developed the water budget model, a water balance model that was um, done um, many, many years ago. Um, I show here um, the historical record of that data from 1989 to 2020. Looks like there's a little shift in the data there. I apologize for that. So we went into presentation mode, but um, <clears throat> so that data, what we had to do is uh, we worked closely with the Division of Water Resources to obtain their water budget model data. We had to do some alignment with that data with our study area to arrive at uh, what the various depletions were. Uh, based on interest area, you can see, again, those four interest areas are identified at the bottom of the chart there with district service area lands, the district UCRB lands, um, upper Colorado River Basin lands, as well as the lower Colorado River Basin lands. And um, essentially um, calculated the depletions across the study area, again, for the period of record from 89 through 2020. And then the slightly transparent bars that are overlaid there to the right and, um, again, shifted are um, the open ET-based um, depletion results. Um, so uh, what we ultimately found um, is that the remote sensed method depletion volumes were found to be lower than the water budget model results by about 13%. And um, Craig Miller, the developer of the water budget models in the audience, I can quickly you know, step in a pothole here to try to explain all the differences that, that may exist here. But um, generally, I think we've got a consistency where um, if water is available to support a given area, the full potential demand would be met for that field, and so again, I think we're looking at um, some potential ET versus actual observed ET that would pick up, um, again, on some water stress situations. So moving next now into um, characterizing this data. So once we're able to calculate the field scale depletions and aggregate that up, you know, through the various interest areas, that intersecting with the water-related land use data set, uh, which included attribute data um, related to irrigation method, uh, related to crop type, we could then look into what portion of these depletions are aligned with um, these various attributes. So um, in this case, we're looking at um, depletions uh, via the various irrigation methods that are identified in the water-related land use data set. Um, predominantly uh, sprinkler and flood irrigation. There's also um, within the data set sub-irrigated sub lands are identified as well as drip irrigation of which there's, there's very, very little. So uh, predominantly um, sprinkler irrigation, about 60% of the depletion in the study area was aligned with sprinkler. Uh, flood or surface irrigation, about 31% of that, with um, the bulk of those depletions occurring in district service area lands and district service area lands that fall within the Upper Colorado River Basin. Those are followed up then with um, depletions in the Upper Colorado River Basin um, lands that are outside of the district, and lastly, just that small bit of lower basin um, lands that are included in the study area. Similarly, uh, we looked at crop type characterization. So again here, um, bulk of those depletions in the district uh, or district upper Colorado River Basin lands, those depletions are aligned predominantly with forage crops. Uh, forage crops are um, the predominant um, crops grown in the state of Utah, um, ultimately to support um, livestock, livestock production. Roughly two thirds of forage crops grown support uh, livestock production within the state. Um, which, um, you know, makes crop, some of the crop switching discussions um, um, challenging or, or at least more constrained anyway, right? We're not going to start growing strawberries or something like that. So um, 
aligned, you know, as far as the various crops here, we've got hay turf, um, including alfalfa and grass hay. The turf piece is aligned with uh, turf farms that are, um, that, you know, are located in Utah. There's very few of these fields, so really the, the hay turf group is predominantly alfalfa and grass hay. Um, again, as you can see, about 70% of those total depletions. Um, and then uh, pasture land makes up about 20% of the depletions as well. So all combined, um, the alfalfa, grass, hay, and pasture make up roughly 90% of the depletions um, in our study area. So ultimately, you know, our goal was really to drive towards a field scale geospatial depletion model where we had attribute data um, that would identify irrigation method and um, the crops that are grown on that field such that we could then um, use this information as a basis um, to identify the opportunities to reduce that depletion, right? Once we have that baseline, we can look at what are the opportunities related to um, changing the irrigation methods, uh, what are the opportunities related to um, changing crop types, and um, ultimately informing uh, both Central Utah and the River Authority on, um, you know, potential programs that, that may benefit them um, as they work towards um, continued agricultural resilience. Um, with respect to irrigation method conversions, we're working closely with Utah State University, who's recently released um, a conversion calculator. It's an online conversion calculator that allows you to input um, the starting irrigation method, to input also the, um, con the irrigation method that you're converting to, and get a sense of the change in um, water use, the change in depletion, where some of those losses are occurring, um, whether it be deep perk uh, through evaporation or runoff, and how, um, you know, how your depletion might change as a result of that conversion. Um, and then lastly, um, the crop changes um, were currently using the consumptive use of irrigated crops report from Dr. Hill, uh, which identifies crops typically grown in Utah and the consumptive uses associated with them to understand if we do make a switch, um, what, what is the expectation as far as reduction in depletion. So with that, um, that concludes my presentation. Happy to take any questions that you might have. Very nice, thank you so much. Uh, one quick question. We have time for one quick question. Can you come up to the microphone, Nisha? Oh. Thank you, Scott, for the outstanding presentation. Oh, thanks, Aisha. Yeah, and, and I'm Aisha Klitsch from University of Nebraska. I'm currently doing sabbatical in Florida. I hope uh, you all have a fantastic afternoon, and I love you all. Just So my question was, uh, it, this is awesome, you know, what you're doing. What's your ultimate goal? What, what you're trying to accomplish by changing irrigation practices, you, you know, are, are we, if we're thinking about the big picture, mm -hmm. sustainability of water resources, you know, keeping that groundwater sustainable, then what's the benefit? I understand the resilience, the benefit of changing irrigation practices. Yeah, um, good question, Aishi. Um, so, I mean, I, I when this project first kicked off, the ultimate goal was, is there an opportunity to identify changes that producers could make where they could maintain their production and, and lead to lower depletion values you know, in their operation? And that in turn would, again, um, help them not only maintain production, but it would also free up potential water that they could put into water markets, they could potentially monetize, um, and, and further support them. And I think from a you know, drought risk standpoint, it would allow them to, um, during wet years, um, get some of that additional water into storage to try to bolster our storage reservoirs. During dry years, 
they, um, through the optimization measures, they would be able to maintain, again, production with lower water use and, and be more res resilient in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the uh, couple of other questions, Martha, if I can. Okay. Okay. Just All right. Just, more. I was wondering how the carryover soil moisture is calculated. And third, are there any attempts to kind of voice water literacy at the, across the state of Utah? you know, knowing all these challenges that people are dealing with. And it seems like they are really at the forefront, you know, with the more water resilient, uh, you know, society, community. Yeah. yeah. Um, so as, as far as carryover soil moisture, that's, um, again, that follows that 1989 Dr. Hill report and includes available water capacity in the root zone depth and and um, non-growing season precipitation as well as non-growing season ET. So there's a lot of, a lot of variables in there. Um, you know, I wouldn't be able to spit off the exact equation, but generally it, in, it incorporates those various things. Um, and as far as um, growing the, the, the conversation, if you will, or the literacy for resiliency um, in Utah, I think it's events like this that help us do that. I think, um, you know, fostering additional collaboration across the many agencies in Utah working on these topics um, to share, to not only grow alignment, but also to share um, concerns or, or questions or areas where we need to improve is, is how we get there. Mm 